As far as PC gaming goes, everyone loves talking about the original Deus Ex like no other, even 20 years on. However, much less is said for the 2003 sequel, Invisible War. So it's finally time to go back and talk about its weighty subject matter and improvements to the gameplay, while acknowledging its design handicaps that have left it with a strangely unique cult status. Most folks skip over Invisible War in favour of the prequels, and those that do play it are annoyed by the changes to the augmentation mechanics and skill system. The few that persevere have come to appreciate the greater nuance of these changes and the quality storytelling and themes that, much like its predecessor, still remain highly relevant. Before we go any further, it's time to talk about canonicity. Deus Ex 1 and 2 were made by Iron Storm. They shared the same teams, and most importantly, the writers and designers. Warren Spector may have formed Deus Ex originally and took a backseat role for the sequel, but the core team, like Harvey Smith, Alexander Brandon, and Sheldon Bacotti, were all present. Invisible War was the game they wanted to make, and Iron Storm had the budget to deliver on their vision. Yes, there were limitations by having it run on the Xbox, but the statements from the devs, including Warren Spector, indicate they were fine with the changes and the end result. This matters because although contemporary critics highly praise the game, modern players whose introduction to the series came via Human Revolution seem to have dismissed Invisible War. This is kind of misguided for a couple of reasons. The reboot franchises has zilch of the original team, and it shows with good, solid mechanics and boring stories and themes. The other reason is that Invisible War had already corrected the mistakes that Human Revolution and especially Mankind Divided would make, because it was a sequel and not a spiritual successor. This makes many of the retrospectives of the series somewhat disingenuous when Invisible War is skimmed over. It is the truest Deus Ex sequel in terms of continuity. So how did they continue Deus Ex? Streamline gameplay and doubling down on the AI transhumanistic themes for about 12 to 15 hours, with some of the most impressive and janky graphics of the early 2000s. This means spoilers for Deus Ex, but it's been 20 years, come on. I'm not going to spoil Invisible War too much, but I will have to talk about some characters, themes, and motivations. To circumvent how different players choose the endings, IW starts up with a combination of all three. 20 years after DX's ending, where JC defeated MJ-12, merged with Helios, and crashed the global communication network, society has had to rebuild and is currently in the crossroads of the WTO, who have created a level of stability post-collapse, and the Order, a religious amalgamation that wants to curb biomodification and extensive technology development. The opening of the game doesn't quite do this justice, nor does the first few sections. Chicago is wiped out in a grey goo bomb by Order members who may or may not have gone rogue and were targeting the Tarsus School, a scientific paramilitary organisation where your character, Alex D, is attending. There's a lot of replayability in the game, which is made clear as soon as you're given the choice of playing as either a male or female, which creates differences in character reactions and dialogue. Alright, it's pretty undeniable that the MC model looks pretty terrible, strangely worse than the NPCs. I don't know why, honestly. After the tutorial prologue, you can freely explore Seattle, doing odd jobs, taking up assignments with either WTO or The Order to progress to the next hub area, ranging from Cairo, Egypt, to Trier, Germany, to Antarctica. This is much closer to a choice-driven RPG than a linear progression with a few branching paths like the original. You can meet up with all the factions and talk to your fellow Tarsus recruits from the opening that have each gone their separate ways. It's extremely worthwhile to do this alongside talking with other NPCs because IW's themes are much more nuanced. Because it carries on the endings of Deus Ex, it's not much of a spoiler to reveal the Illuminati has taken the reins of control and the JC Helios hybrid is a major part of the story. Like, come on, your character's initials are literally AD. What becomes apparent through exploring the world is how clear societal problems are and how morally murky the solutions have become. This is something not clearly identifiable in the opening, thus requiring more time for the pieces to be set up. Biomods are extremely powerful and useful, but work as gatekeepers for the vast majority who can't afford them. But the collapse and ensuring ecological disasters fell into those most vulnerable. The Illuminati looks to control and regulate these issues through more traditional 20th century liberal capitalism, but it won't solve them. More radical elements splintering off from the Order want to abolish them at the root, making another collapse totally avoidable, regardless of how horrific the means. There are those that seek to use AI to help bridge the limitations of mankind to its ambitions, removing inequalities, conflicts, and free will. Disappointingly, the game doesn't really criticise this position nearly as much as the other two, which leads most players to adopting it. The transhumanistic argument is pretty convincing when the few AIs you encounter are pretty cool and most biomodified folks are easily the least annoying and hostile. It's the subtleties, however, that makes things interesting. Rampant nanotechnology development has made the literal air of whole cities toxic. 
those cool AIs are also really effective surveillance systems. Remember those annoying fucking Greasels vs Life created from the first game? Now they're an infestation everywhere, an end result of unfettered experimentation. So maybe the preaching zealots have a point, especially when their members are the most committed and motivated while everyone else just wants a paycheck. But if the constant machinations, assassinations, and threats by factions isn't your thing, you may choose the no gods or kings path of a typical anarchist. Although in such a dysfunctional world, a total breakdown in centralized authority is probably not going to help very much. The end result is that you can see and understand the justifications for the competing ideologies, yet also what makes them so reprehensible. The closest comparison I can think of is Fallout New Vegas. You have to really question what it means to be human, whether technology is an inherent societal positive, and is violence justifiable against a rigged system of enforced inequalities, and how far would you go for that? Dude, I'm sorry, but you gotta go. Your bloodline's gotta go. Give me your kids. Smash their fucking heads in. Wealth inequality, transhumanism, radical religions and ideologies, the degrading environment are topics more relevant than ever today, and there's no easy answer like a vaccine to cure a pandemic, or a single shadowy villain or organization to overthrow. You have to weigh and choose the best of the worst options. This is executed through a huge amount of voice lines by some real high quality talent. Alex D is played by either Christopher Sabat or Laura Bailey as quite early roles, and they pull off the deadpan delivery well, with enough dry sarcasm that makes Alex a likeable protagonist. It also makes choosing sides a tough decision. Like the WTO is staffed with annoying fucking Frenchies, but it does have Tiffany Grant, so... What are you, stupid? The problem with the added talent across the cast is that you don't get those wonderfully terror bad line reads. The post-post dystopia has plenty of ironic and dark humor that still makes parts of the game funny. You just can't memeify it like in the original. Oh my god, JC, a bomb! A bomb. Yet, while I appreciate the details, it isn't perfect. A substantial amount of background lore of the factions and characters can be missed if you don't listen to some obscure conversation. One of the factions, the Omar, are a group of cyborg hive mind merchants that will sell you gear. How they actually became like this is only found out in some NPC dialogue when you actively rat them out in one of the early quests. I couldn't have just asked? My other gripe from the fairly non-critical take on transhumanism is that the reoccurring characters from DX pretty much dominate the later half of the story with any new faces relegated to minor side roles. It's made worse how the characters themselves have done a 180. Case in point is Chad Dumier, head of the WTO. In the first game, he leads the French resistance group Silhouette and espouses decidedly anarchist rhetoric. Then suddenly he's pro-status quo and a lying smug asshole. Then there's Tracer Tong, who fought against the use of technology for controlling people his entire life. Except now, forcing transhumanism on everyone is totally acceptable. I just don't understand these changes aside from an easy wink to players of the original. Speaking of, this story would have made no fucking sense to players on the Xbox original, particularly how they didn't get a port of DX, PS2 players did. I can only imagine the mindfuckery they felt. Now then, as a game, IW functionally plays like a first person action RPG with different avenues of approach to objectives which you use your biomods and tools to achieve, much the same like in DX. What comes glaringly obvious is how more restricted you are by the much smaller level sizes, barely a third of the original's maps. The original used the Unreal Engine to offer a great diversity of playstyles with open and interior areas meshing together enabling both fast paced action and slow cautious stealth tactics. Despite running on Unreal 2, there's only a couple of sections in Invisible War where it approaches this, making encounters quite linear and cramped. To me, this is the biggest flaw, especially as it gets almost everything else right. Skill levels have been removed. Instead, the focus is on upgrading biomods and getting new equipment either through exploration, buying them with credits, or as rewards for completing missions. Honestly, the EXP system was kinda dumb in DX. You sucked at basic combat and technical roles, meaning you spent most of the game's skill points on slightly improving your accuracy or lockpicking abilities. The bloated progression system continued in the biomods, requiring their own, very rare upgrade canisters. By the halfway point, you were decked out in low-level biomods you couldn't remove and easily replace. IW resolves this issue by having just biomod canisters that either can unlock a new ability or upgrade one, improving its effectiveness. There are five body slots with three different biomods for each. Biomods are either activated and drain energy or work passively which always stay on. There's two types of biomods, legal WTO sanctioned ones and black market variants offered by the Yomar. Most new players like myself may feel hesitant in applying biomods due to their formerly rare nature. Here however, their frequency ensures you'll be fully maxed out by the mid game. This is fine as you can swap out different biomods and have plenty left over to upgrade them. 
You may find having the speed and jump enhancement useful when exploring Seattle, then switch to silent movements when breaking to an armed facility in Cairo. A thermal masking hides you from sentries and cameras, or you may prefer having a melee attacks disable electronics outright. The limited flexibility and rewarding experimentation works wonderfully in making the bio mods extremely helpful, though some more than others. Pretty much from start to finish, the hacking mod is always useful in solving puzzles and shutting off security, and there's not enough vertical environments to take full advantage of increased jumping. While you may lack in mods, you can make up a large range of grenades and firearms. The inventory system has scaled down from the grid system, which initially seems annoying, except you end up holding about the same amount of equipment, if not a bit more particularly when lockpicks and multi tools are now just one item. This is because you're meant to use and lose equipment as needed as there's no dominant build, rather there's combinations of biomods, weapons and gadgets that support each other. Although usable equipment like hazmat suits and armor are gone, the firearms on offer are a lot more interesting. They're essentially the bread and butter assortment like the original, with a greater inclusion of weapon mods and secondary fire options. The shotgun poofs out a smoke bomb, the SMG a flashbang, the railgun EMP charge. Weapons can have up to two different mods, and they don't take up any inventory space, so you can choose when to apply them. These include scopes, suppressors, rapid fire, explosive, and EMP rounds. Alongside this, the special unique weapon variants that work as fun collectibles, like a bolt gun that sets enemies alive. Much like biomods, it's perfectly normal to ditch equipment and respec your gear when it's appropriate. There's no skill limitations, just inventory space. Of course, you can't just ignore how the ammo system is now just one source. Realistically, it's dumb. This isn't how bullets work, although it does mean you can use heavy weapons without scavenging for supplies constantly. What I don't like is the lack of animations and pretty weak impacts. You'd imagine a shotgun with fragmentation shells at point blank would devastate any target. Nope. Combat in general isn't very fun through floaty controls and reduced enemy count. You'll rarely fight more than half a dozen opponents at any one time until the last sections with annoying armored rocket troops that explode on death and hit scanning snipers. This is because of the aforementioned reduced level sizes that handicap the mechanics outlined, as encounters are now too short and compacted to really best utilize all the abilities and mods. It also harms the immersion with bizarrely constructed interiors and buildings. You go to an apartment of four units, an entire bar with two tables, or a school with three classrooms, all while dozens of NPCs loiter around. Where the fuck do these people eat or sleep? Contrary to most, I really enjoyed the endgame areas where you finally had enough enemies and large enough maps to really get some classic DX moments of switching between stealth and combat alongside divining new paths. Interestingly, these compromises don't affect the stealth system, which is a lot more complicated than crouching and whacking someone with a baton. You have to make real investments in biomods like dampening footsteps, dissolving bodies, and different camos. It makes sense when the devs had formerly worked on the Thief games and were making Thief 3 at the time. People attribute these reductions in order to play on the Xbox. This isn't entirely true, as the Xbox was a powerful machine in onto itself. Instead, it was having really nice graphics and being badly optimized. Reviews frequently point this out, and even now, it still looks pretty good. How fires and light bulbs stream light and shadows across the ground and walls was years ahead of the time. It is less impressive when trying to get the fucking thing working. Regardless of how it's been released on GOG and Steam, it's often a janky mess of uneven frame rates, floaty controls, glitchy visual effects, and limited resolutions. A lot of this can be fixed by the visible tweaker mod, but as you can see, the HUD isn't properly formatted for high scaling. There's also a range of smaller but really annoying quirks and bugs, like how, randomly, items will refuse to stack, wasting limited inventory space, or how there's a weird delay when switching weapons, temporarily disabling you. A bizarre technical feature is to clear up the memory cache, the game resets during loading screens, but will freeze when using Shadowplay. Fucking amazing, back to Bandicam. It's a far cry from the relative stability and ease of use of Deus Ex, and probably a major reason why players give up on the game. But if you're willing to overcome these technical hurdles, compacted levels that limit the overall design of the game, the janky combat, and accept the changes made to the gameplay and biobond mechanics, Deus Ex Invisible War is a solid title and a good follow-up to the original. Most of the streamlining cleans up the bloat and makes the mechanics more practical, and when it all ties together, the gameplay is easily among the best in the franchise. People can try and ignore that Deus Ex had a sequel that was a critical and commercial success, Well fuck that! This isn't fanfiction, this is the narrative internal direction the creators chose, and I believe it's kind of unfair to outright dismiss it. Of course, I'll probably betray this entire thought process when it's convenient, but just imagine it is consistent and apply it when looking back onto Invisible War and consider giving it a shot. After all, it predicted the rise of simping for V-girls, so that's at least something. 
It's pretty widely distributed and you can get it working with some patience. If you consider yourself a fan of the series, I strongly recommend putting the effort into Deus Ex's true and underrated sequel. Got the enemy. Did you hit it off? Not really. That so-called dating service ripped me off. Tell me about the young woman. Well, first of all, she wasn't young. 